Man, it is. Father, I thank you, Lord. I've already felt your presence in this house tonight. God, I pray that you'd give me unction now, Heavenly Father, in your word. And pray for the Holy Spirit to be able to move in this house freely. Our Father, for a little while tonight, Lord, let us approach you. And turn from this world and its influence, its word, its spirit, and come into your presence. And Father, tonight I pray, Lord, that you'd speak into every heart that's here. And let the heart be receptive, Father. Let us be receptive. God, we pray, teach us, lead us. In thy name we ask it. And amen. And amen. Thank you. Thank you for that song. That was good. Amen, amen, amen. I hadn't heard any songs this day. I listened to very little, and uh, that was good. I uh, want to bring you abreast of what's going on here, and then we'll get into the lesson tonight. I got on the uh, website of the Lion of Judah and got to uh, digging around and finally found the uh, stat page, the statistics. And uh, you may not know this, but these servers that... Uh, send out all these uh, web pages that you log on to, they keep a record. The record of who hits it, when they hit it, where they hit it from, how long they're on there, what files they pull up, all kinds of st statistics. And uh, I uh, was shocked today when I discovered something. Very shocked. And I wanted to uh, tell you about that tonight. I just want you to know that uh, God has blessed this Internet ministry. It's an amazing thing. For example, up until this point right now in November, and we're still a third of the month, of, we're, in, we're a third into the month of November, 3,201 people have visited the website. That's how many people have visited the site. They've visited, they've, uh, they've made uh, uh, hits and so forth, and viewed videos and downloaded pages and what have you. The month of November, 10,275 people visited the website. That's a lot of people. That's a sight more than we've got in here tonight. <laughs> That's a lot of people. Now I got into the top 30 of the 60 countries that are viewing this website, and this is where the shock hit me. I had no idea. I had no idea. The countries, in other words, where are they watching from? Where are they watching from? Well, the vast majority are watching from the United States. Uh, for example, 110,911 hits. That means that they logged onto the page, they touched a file, they, they navigated through the page, they downloaded something. Every time they do something on that web page, it's a hit. That's the way they figure it. It could be one person with 20 hits. So you need to understand that. That doesn't mean 110,911 people. But still, 110,911 is quite a bit. But now that's just from the United States. That's just this country. Then 36,152 hits from the U.S. commercial market. IBM, uh, Ford, uh, I don't know where these things are coming from. 23,077 hits, unresolved and unknown. The first foreign country that pops up on the list, and by far, it's at least eight to ten times more than any other country. And this is what blew my mind. 11,920 hits from this country in October. Russia. The Russian Federation. And the month of November, it's carrying right on. The month of November... The Russian Federation, right now, the third end of the month, we have 3,167 hits. Have you ever heard of a man named Karl Marx? Das Kapital. He is the fellow who wrote the Tom Communist Manifesto back in the 1800s. Vladimir Lenin made that his Bible. And he led the Bolsheviks in overthrowing Tsar Nicholas, murdered his family, and turned Russia into a communist, atheistic state. We will wipe God from the face of the earth. Now we have more Russians watching us than anybody else. The word of God. I tell you, that's a victory. Glory to God. Hallelujah. If that doesn't mean anything, that'll make you shout. That'll make you say to yourself, I mean, 
Khrushchev came over here and beat the, beat the, beat the uh, podium up there in the UN and said, we'll bury you. Well, he's been buried. <laughs> Long buried. But the gospel of Christ is going into Russia. Hallelujah. Amen. We don't have any missionaries in Russia. We're the missionary in Russia. Preaching the word, sending the papers, the, the, uh, the pages, the material. And we intend to add a lot of material to the website, readable material, where people can do their own research and get this. I thought to myself, hallelujah, praise God, glory to God, this is something else. Now, this is kind of scary, though. Uh, some of the other places watching it, the United Kingdom, that's fine, Great Britain, Ireland, uh, the U.S. Educational Establishment, a bunch of people, Canada, 747 hits so far in the month of October. And then this one, the U.S. government, 718 hits. FBI, CIA, you reckon they're checking us out? You reckon they're watching us? Big brother. <laughs> we'll preach to him too, amen. <clears throat> 718 hits from Big Brother. <laughs> That's all right. God's got a sense of humor. Did you know that? Russia. Hallelujah. I never thought for a minute we were preaching to Russians. Glory to God. If they're watching us tonight, we love you. Hallelujah. Amen. That's why we're here. We're preaching the word. Amen. <laughs> All right. If you'll turn the book of Galatians with me tonight, please. One man in the Bible, in the New Testament, is used as a type of the believer. And that man is Abraham. And I'm going to point tonight, I'm going to... I'm, I'm going to uh, Focus tonight on a certain aspect of Abraham and, and, and his life and his faith. But if you'll look at the Galatians chapter number 3, Galatians 3 and 4, the Apostle Paul uses Abraham, and he uses him in a lot of different ways to teach different lessons. And he uses Abraham to teach these Galatian believers because he said to them, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you, having begun in the Spirit, are you now perfected in the flesh? Judaizers and legalizers had come to the church of Galatia and had begun to teach these people that they needed to be circumcised, keep the law of Moses, all these other things in order to be saved and stay saved. And, they, and the apostle Paul didn't pull any punches. He said, I worry you were even cut off, condemned, sent to hell for coming and teaching that kind of doctrine to people. For salvation is not by the law, and it is not by, uh, by legalism, it is by faith. And this is why he uses Abraham. He uses Abraham as an object lesson to teach the element of faith. In plain words, he said, let me show you something. Look how this man believed, how he lived, and you'll understand. But what he does here in Galatians chapter number 4 is to show you what must take place and what will take place when it comes down to the issue of faith. In the third chapter of Galatians, he uses Abraham, and he says, Abraham had seed. Well, you're the seed of Abraham. And he's talking about seed, seed in the sense that it's passed from generation to generation. In plainer words, if you are of the people who believe God, trust His Word, and accept His Son by faith as your Savior, you are of Abraham, of His seed. Because that seed that Abraham passes on is a supernatural seed. And it is generated from generation to generation to generation. You didn't receive that from your father. You didn't receive it from your mother. Salvation is not inherited. The Apostle Paul or John made that clear in John chapter number 1, which were born not of the flesh. Salvation is not an inherited thing. But this faith that Abraham talks about tonight, that uh, Apostle talks about using Abraham as an object lesson. He points out some things here that are very, very important to understand about him. Look at chapter number 4 and verse number 22. Galatians 4 and verse 22. We get that in one hand and then we'll be going over to the book of Romans, chapter number 4 in just a moment. And uh, chapter number 4, the book of Romans, and verse number 17. In Galatians chapter number 4 and verse 22, it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. He who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. That's how you're here. Everybody in this building was born after the flesh, or you wouldn't be here. 
But he of the free woman was by, now notice the word, promise. That's a big word. That's a powerful word. It's a very powerful word. Why is it powerful? Because it is God Almighty giving you something in His Word that is full, pregnant with meaning and pregnant with ability. It's just a matter of whether you can receive it or not. God puts it out there and that it's up to you as to whether you can receive what God said. It's that simple. It's not a matter of whether you can do anything. It's whether you can receive the engrafted Word. Receiving the word is this. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that you've got it in your head and you say, well, I believe all these things. That's not receiving it. Receiving the word is receiving it into your heart where you begin to act upon it. That's receiving it. You embrace it. You take it into yourself. It becomes part of you. You're taking what God said as absolute truth and your life is established on that. You can't be moved from it. If God said it, that finishes it, whether you believe it or not. And so he, we have here two sons born of one man, Abraham, by two different women. Now, God had made a promise to Abraham. And you, know all, you all know about the promise. God said, I'm going to make, not of this, I'm, I'm going to give you a seed. And this seed I am going to bless. And through this seed, I'm going to bless the earth. And through this seed, I am going, uh, he didn't say to him, but through that seed, the Messiah is going to come. And he did come. He was born exactly the way you were born and the way all of us were born by the Spirit. The Lord Jesus Christ was born of the Holy Ghost. What's that mean? That means that if Mary had rejected the word of Gabriel, she would never have become pregnant. She had to receive what Gabriel said. And when Mary said, let it be unto me according to thy word, Unto thine handmaid. What did she say? I'm receiving the word. By receiving the word, she was impregnated by the power of the Spirit of God, giving life to her through the word of God. You ever notice how the word throughout the scripture, Genesis to Revelation, is life giving? You ever notice how to receive the word you're receiving life and to reject the word you're rejecting life in whatever, in whatever sense it can be understood? She received the word and received life where Christ could be born. You receive the word and you're receiving eternal life. You're receiving eternal life through salvation. So the Bible said he had two sons, Ishmael by Hagar and Isaac by uh, Sarah. And so the Bible says that one of these was born after the flesh. It was born after Abraham's physical, earthly ability. The other one was born by promise. Sarah had to receive from God the word that, re that, in, that generated life within her to bear that son. Abraham had to believe the word of God to have the seed to generate the son. So it took both of them believing the promise of God. The promise of God is God's ability to perform what He said He will do, but it's up to you to believe it. Now notice what happens here in Galatians. And this happens with every one of us. Chapter 4, verse 22. It is written, Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, a slave, the other a free woman. Why would the apostle call her a slave and the other a free woman? Because a slave can only beget a slave. Freedom begets freedom. Life begets life. Death begets death. Verse 23. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. Because why? The flesh is indebted to sin and in bondage to sin. The flesh could not produce the promise. But he of the free woman was by promise. Which things are an allegory? For these are the two covenants. The one from Mount Sinai, the law given to condemn you, convict you, and make you a sinner, make you conscious of your sin, and the only thing it could do then was to bring you guilty before God where you begged for, for a Redeemer. That was it. That's what the message of Galatians 3 was about. So he said, The one from Mount Sinai which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar, for this Agar, which is the New Testament saying of Hagar, is Mount Sinai in Arabia, where the law was given, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, to Jerusalem and the earth, where Christ was crucified, because all the law could do was nail him to a tree, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, 
which is the mother of us all. Now, you folks in Sunday school last Sunday morning, I went through that in detail. If you remember, we talked about how that, that mother above is the mother of us all, which Jerusalem which is free. For it is written, Rejoice thou barren that bearest not, break forth and cry, thou that travailest not, for the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. And what he's saying here is that the one who could not be expected to bear children did bear children. Throughout the Old Testament, time and again, God used types like he did when he brought forth, when, when, uh, when, when uh, Jacob had, uh, he had, uh, he had Leah and she was having one child right after another. And he also had four concubines. And, but his, his love, Rachel, was barren. But God opened her womb. Supernaturally, he opened her womb. Now watch this. Now we, brethren, as Isaac, are children of the promise, of promise. Now, do you relate to that? Do you really believe that's talking about you? You have to understand something. He's going to say something right here in a minute that will make you mad if you're not really born again. It's going to make you mad. It really is. And he intends to make you mad. The apostle Paul meant to make them so mad that it revealed their true nature. He showed you at the very beginning of the book of Galatians how that the Judaizers, the legalizers, and all these had entered in into the midst of born-again believers. Here they came with their Bibles under their arms. Here they came with their scrolls of the law. Here they came with their robes. Here they came with their prayer shawls. Here they came with all of the religious apparel that anybody could have. They looked good. They sounded good. They looked like that they were part of them. They believed in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They could quote the law verbatim. But there was something missing. Something all important was missing. They were very religious and they appeal to the flesh. Because the flesh knows it needs something. The flesh knows it has a problem. Your flesh should know it's got a problem. What's the remedy for your flesh? The first thing that our parents did when their flesh revealed itself to them, when they really realized what their flesh was and what it was worth, what did they do? They covered themselves up. They tried to hide behind fig leaves. Now look what the apostle says in Galatians chapter 4. We, brethren, as Isaac, are the children of promise. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuteth him that was born after the Spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what saith the Scripture? Cast out the bondwoman. Well, historically, this is what happened. Ishmael was 13 years older than Isaac. That's quite a bit. When Isaac was a little boy, Ishmael was a young man. 13 years older than him. That's how much time had progressed between the time that Isaac, the promise of God, came and Abraham tried to do it himself in the flesh and God answered. A few years later, God causes you to wait. And so the Bible says he looked out one day, Abraham did, and he saw, I, he saw Ishmael mocking, mocking Isaac, making fun of him. And I'm sure he probably was prodded by his mother. Hagar. They were making fun of Isaac. Now Ishmael was, a, was probably a handsome young man. Ishmael was a strong young man. Ishmael had all of the physical characteristics of Abraham because he was born after the flesh. He inherited Abraham's stature. Abraham was quite a man, friends. And Abraham was a man who, who, who didn't take a back seat. If they came in and took Lot, he took 318 of his own hired servants and went and got him. Abraham was a man who, when he even went off into a foreign country, the king recognized this man as being a, like a prince. He's a man. He's not just a, he's not a groveling slave. Here's a man that had, had charisma and all that. Well, he passed it on to Ishmael. Ishmael had all of these physical characteristics. Ishmael was probably a standing tall, fine-looking young man. Problem was, Ishmael was born after the flesh. Isaac was born after the promise. They were incompatible. For a while they lived together. For a while they grew together. For a while they were in home together. For a while they went to church together. For a while they sang the songs of the same songs together. They even might have read the same Bible together. But the day came when Ishmael's flesh could stand no more. Because Ishmael was all about the flesh. Because he had nothing else. And when that day came, he began to mock Isaac. Because Isaac wasn't about the flesh. 
He wasn't about stature. He wasn't about appearance. He wasn't about physical strength. He was about something that had happened to him and he knew in his soul. He was in this world because of the miraculous hand of God. He knew it. He knew it. And because of that, Ishmael mocked him. And you know what happened? Abraham cast Hagar out. And when he cast her out, she went out into the field. And you know the story. The angel met her out there. She thought she was going to die. He said, cast out the bondwoman because she can't live with a promise. She can't do it. The flesh can't make it. It can't live. You take a church full of born-again believers that love the Lord Jesus Christ, that preach Christ and Him crucified, and that church is about the Lord Jesus. It's not about strutting the flesh. It's not about human achievement. It's not about how great we are. It's not about who we are. It's about who He is. You take a church that focuses on the Son of God like that, and I'll guarantee you there will be a conflict between he that is born after the flesh and he that is born after the Spirit. Because the unbeliever will become angered. He'll be mad because he thinks you're overlooking the things that are important, the things that matter. Well, let me tell you what matters. The Lord Jesus Christ is what matters. He's all that matters. He's all that matters. And what happens here now? Look at what the apostle is doing. He is saying by this, look at the, look at the contrast. He is saying Abraham cast out the bondwoman, didn't he? He cast her out. So what's he implying to these people? What's he saying to the Galatian believers? Get rid of them. That's what he's saying. Get them out of your midst. If they won't get right, if they won't get saved, and you can't just get saved. <laughs> In other words, if they're not going to be born again, and they continue to cause you problems, and they continue to mock the gospel of the grace of God. And I hear preachers mock it all the time. The people who believe they can lose their salvation, they got a problem with, the, with for by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourself, the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. they got a problem with it. They have a problem with eternal security. They have a problem with me believing that He is able to keep that which I've committed to Him against that day. I honestly believe that some of those people are truly born again. They just got the wrong doctrine. But I believe their ranks are full of people who are born after the flesh and not after the Spirit. Because a guilty sinner falls before God and knows there's not a thing you can do to save your soul. There's nothing you can do to keep yourself saved. You know the best you can do still falls far short. You know it is if you're honest. You know it is. You say to yourself, God's got to make a way for me. He's got to make a way. And that's when you take the Word. That's what this is about. This is what Paul's saying. It's not about some thing that you can come into the church and take hold of. You know, you can't come in here and take hold of something and say, I'm taking hold of this and God's going to save me. No, you're not. He's not saving you because of some thing or not some thing you do. It's His Word that's gone out. Word. His character. Who He is. Is He a liar or does He tell the truth? Is it impossible for God to lie? Yeah. Well, then if He, t if he says it, then he's bound to his word. Now here's the problem. It's on your back. Can you receive the word, the promise of God? Can you look him eyeball to eyeball and say, Lord God, you said it, that's good enough. Lord God, help my unbelief. I believe with all I got to believe with. God, give me more to believe with. Amen. What you're saying is, I'm an absolute complete failure. I can't make it. I know I can't. I give up now. Right now, I put down all my guard and I'm saying, God, help me. That man will get saved. And that man will receive something from God. And you'll go down a path that God Almighty will open the doors for. You'll go down a path that God will lead you in. And this is what the Apostle Paul dealt with. He dealt with it severely. He said, kick him out. He did. Why would he use an illustration of uh, cast out the bondwoman? Because the two are incompatible. You can't live together. Flesh can live with flesh. One religion is compatible with another religion. When the religion is all about the flesh, why, well, you may even be able to incorporate other elements of another religion into your flesh. Well, that's no big deal. 
Why, good night, man. There's nothing to that as far as going along and saying, well, I'm moral. I'm moral too. Well, I have my beliefs. you got my beliefs too. Well, I believe in this. Well, I believe in this too. Well, I think my religion ought to... Why, my religion ought to this. Yeah, and blah, blah. No big deal. But when it comes down to the Lord Jesus Christ, is He the Son of the promise? Is the, is, is the Lord Jesus the Son of promise? Was He promised? Yes, He was. When Simeon held that little baby up, the old man, old man, an old man holding an eight-day-old baby in his hands, he said, I have seen thy salvation. Now, hold on a minute, Simeon. Now, let's get this straight. Let me get it right now. You believe that that little baby you're holding in your hands right there is going to save your soul. Yep. Yep. Well, now, how's he going to do that, Simeon? Why, you know, you got him in your hand. What's you drop him? If you dropped him while the little fella died right here to a concussion or crack his head up, why, this little eight-day-old infant can't save anybody. Oh, yeah, he can. Well, how do you know he can? Because he's the Savior. He's the Savior. He's the promised Messiah. He's the one that should come. And it's not the flesh of Christ that saves. It's the blood of Christ shed at the cross that saves. Now, let me spell that out for you. It's not artifacts. It's not relics. It's not religious things. And even if you had his flesh 2,000 years old, and no one has that because none of his flesh was left here, <laughs> that couldn't save you. You're not saved by his works. You're not saved by his acts. You're not saved by his title or position. How are you saved then, preacher? By him. He that hath the Son hath life. Well, now, how can I have him? I mean, he's not here anymore. Can you have the Lord Jesus since he's not here anymore? Well, how can that be? If he's not here, how can I have him? Well, that's why he sent the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit, when He comes, will not speak of Himself. The Holy Ghost comes not speaking of Himself. Well, then if He doesn't speak of Himself, who does He speak of? It's a good question, isn't it? Who does He speak about, brother? Jesus. Well, then, then He's all about Jesus. That's exactly right. He's all about the Son of God. Incidental to that. Okay. What do you mean by incidental? Well, let me see if I can, I don't know if I, it's kind of hard to let me give you an illustration of it. His purpose in coming into this world is not to heal men. His purpose in coming into this world is not to make men free. His purpose in coming into this world is to convince men of sin because they believe not on Christ and to receive him as their savior. But just because he happens to be around <laughs> men start getting healed and men are set free all kinds of things happen just because he's here but you see he didn't come to do that he came to make the Lord Jesus Christ seated at the right hand of the Father alive to you he lives he's a living Savior now this is the this is the, the soul heart and soul of what I'm talking about tonight you're not going to see him. You're not going to touch him. You're not, you're, not, you're not going to have him pay you a visit physically where all of a sudden he shows up on your doorstep and, and you can believe on him. You've heard his word. All right. Now let me tell you how important the word is, okay? The rich man in hell said, if I go back, let me go back. I'll warn my five brethren lest they come to this awful place of torment. Just let me go. When they see me, when they see what I look like, when they see me, that's just been belched up out of hell, it will shock them into salvation. No, no. What did Abraham say? No, they have, they have, they have the word. They have Moses and the prophets. Do you realize how powerful that word is? Do you ever realize how powerful the name of Jesus is? Some of you have prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and waited and waited and waited for God to do something when all along he put 
a word into your heart that will explode into faith if you can receive it. When I bowed my head on that sofa that day, I just bowed my head. Deacon sitting on this side, I'm sitting here. Some of the family members in the room. Two, three, four, I think about five of us in there. I bowed my head. I said, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Now let me tell you some things that happened, okay? I meant what I said, number one. Number two, I knew I was talking to God because I was under deep conviction and my heart reached up to him. I knew he heard me. Number three, when I bowed that head and said what I said, I believed what I had done right then. I believed it. I accepted it. I embraced it. I received him right on that spot. When I called upon his name, I said, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. And when I raised my head up, I had received the Son of God. And my life had changed immediately. Immediately. Right on the spot. Some folks have such a hard time receiving God's word. And I can't explain. I don't have all the answers. No. And they weren't even my words, brother. I don't even remember all the I don't even remember what all I said. I just know what I I know what I did. I know what I did. And I know when I raised my head up I wasn't the same. I had changed completely from that moment on. Such a profound change, it's it just blows my <laughs> I can't explain it to you. You have to there's no way. You have to you have to do that. You have to be born again. And when I raised my head up, I knew I was in a different world. I was not the same man that, read, that lowered my head. And man, I'm, I'm telling you right now, friends, I came from a hell hole. I lived 27 years in hell. 27 years of it. 27 years. Never a hell hole you can imagine. And I raised up my head. Glory to God, I wasn't, <laughs> wasn't me anymore. That's 36 years ago. That's 36 years ago. I received, I took in, and He has never left. Let me ask you this. Do you believe God? He that cometh to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. All right, when you believe Him, you're receiving His Word. When you receive His Word, you've taken seed into you. You've taken something inside of you that's alive. Amen. Amen. God has planted within you, the moment you receive His Word, He has planted within you a seed that will spring forth into life. Can you receive it? If you can receive His Word tonight, then you can receive from God anything God wants to do for you or communicate to you. Somebody in the flesh says, well, I just, you know, I just believe that a man needs to, I just believe a man needs to, you know, I mean, he ought, he ought, he ought to get some things right first. He needs to, you know, that sounds good. He, he ought to go around and, and just, and just uh, do right about the things he's done wrong and do people right about that he's done wrong and pay his bills, and, and then God will accept him. Doesn't that sound good? See what I mean? What he's trying to say is that I'm going to clean my flesh up. God doesn't accept your person. The Bible said he accepteth no man's person. Does he? He's no respecter of persons. I know some high and mighty don't like that. I realize that. But he does not respect, receive your person. You receive his son who makes no distinction. Now, tonight, if you need God to heal your soul, if you need God to heal your body, if you need God to lift some burdens off your soul, if you need God to open some doors for you, if you need God to do some things for you that, if, if really, the bottom line is, if you just need to give your life to God and let Him take care of what all you need, you know, you really do a whole lot better off. I got down my prayer closet beating the floor and telling God what all I needed and telling Him what I'll need Him to do. And He said, shut your mouth. He said, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. Amen. And when I finally gave it to Him, it wasn't a week, buddy. He started doing things. He really did. He really did. He really did. You, you, you know what I mean by that? Let Him take control. Give it to Him. 
Give it to him. And that's not easy to do. Flesh wants to hold on to it. Give it to him. Father, in Jesus' name, I've given them what you gave me, Lord. Now bless it, Father. With all of my heart, I believe in my soul that I gave them the truth according to the Scriptures. Our Father, tonight there's nobody in this house that's any better than anybody else, nobody any bigger than anybody else, nobody any greater than anybody else. Oh, how wonderful it is, my Father, to stand at the foot of the cross on level ground. How wonderful it is, Father, not to compare ourselves with ourselves. How wonderful it is, Father, for one thing to bring us all together, and that's the name of Jesus. And, Father, tonight bless that sweet, precious, holy name of the Lord Jesus Christ to the hearts of the people that heard it. You tell us in the Word of God in 1 Corinthians that He has made into us righteousness. He's made into us sanctification. He's made into us holiness. What you're saying by that, I believe, Lord, is that if we have the Lord Jesus Christ, we have everything we need when we need it, the way you minister it to us through the person of the Son of God. If we have Him, we have all of these needs fulfilled. In thy holy name we pray, Lord Jesus, and for thy sake we ask it. And I want you to just keep your head bowed for a minute tonight. And I think you ought to start just step by step, really. Sometimes folks get ahead of God and run way ahead of Him, and they didn't get the foundation. As the Apostle said, the first principles of the oracles of God. First, you teach a child the letters. You say these letters right here, pronounce them. This is a letter. Then you put the letters together and you form words. You say this word right here now expresses an idea or a thought. Then you put the words together and you create a sentence. Now you're beginning to communicate. You put the sentences together and make a paragraph, paragraph to matter together, make a chapter, chapters together, and you've got a book. It all starts with learning the alphabet. Have you learned the alphabet yet? Have you got that first principle yet, that first part yet, those simple things that really make all the difference in the world? The simple things, the simple things. Do you believe God? Or do you hear what God says and then you start reasoning in your mind? Then you're believing your mind, not God. I may not understand it, and a lot of things I don't, but I believe His Word. I do. I believe the Word of God. Would you raise your hand tonight and say, Preacher, don't you pray for me because I may need to go back to the beginning, to the start. God bless you, brother, my sister back there. God bless you up here. Amen. God bless you. Folks raising their hands everywhere. <coughs> <coughs> They're very simple. They're very, very simple. Build from that. Once you're sure you know all the alphabet and then you start putting words together, ideas, express ideas and thoughts, communicate. My, what a thing. What a wonderful thing it is when you learn the truths and build on these truths of God. He's no respecter of persons. You may have wasted the first 10 or 15 years of your Christian life, but you don't have to continue wasting it. You can change all that right now. You can walk out of this building tonight a born-again believer, came in a born-again believer, walk out a born-again believer, but walk out a completely different born-again believer with a completely different attitude and understanding of your relationship with the Lord. You can do it. You can do it. How do I do it, preacher? Just receive what He said about you. Receive it. A promise. Boy, when God makes a promise, He's able to fulfill it, isn't He? He's able to bring it to fruition. He sure is. If He makes a promise, He can do it. He said, Abraham, at this time, in a year, you're going to have a son. Ha, 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 she laughed. She wasn't laughing when she brought Isaac into the world. Then God said, call him laughter. Ha, ha, ha. So every time Sarah saw Isaac, she was reminded by his name that she laughed. Father, bless your word now in thy holy name. Bless your name. Bless your sweet holy name. God, in thy name. In the name of Jesus, bless these brothers and these sisters. There may be one in here tonight born after the flesh, but not after the Spirit. There may be one in here tonight who's even gotten to the point of persecution, and they persecute the true believer. God, we pray, 
You can turn the lights on. You can open the heart. You can give them understanding. You can show them their lost condition. You can convict them. In thy holy name we pray, and for Jesus' sake we ask it. Amen. Amen.